So uh, good evening to everyone and uh, welcome uh, the speakers, the esteemed speakers and the viewers to our instruction course on pediatric ocular tumors, children don't complain. We have an array of stalwarts in ocular oncology in this IC session and I'm humbled and honored to have all of them in this instruction course, uh, starting from our mentor of mentor, Dr. Santosh Onawa from Center for Sight Hyderabad, teacher, teacher of teachers again, Dr. Usha Kim, who's a director of oculoplasty at Arvind Eye Care Madurai. And then we have Dr. Seema Das, who heads the oculoplasty department at Dr. Shroff's Charity Eye Hospital, Delhi. Dr. Vikas Menon, uh, who's again uh, in the oculoplasty department, heading it at Arvind Eye Hospital, Chennai. Dr. Anirban Baduri from Sushrut Eye Foundation, who has done extensive work in ocular oncology, again, in that part of the country. And then, uh, well, it's me. So before going, uh, you know, uh, not taking too much time today, we have time constraints. So I would request our first speaker, Dr. Seema Das, uh, to start with her uh, talk on proptosis in children. And Dr. Seema is an excellent uh, orator and she would be sharing a series of cases with us and teaching us more on uh, pediatric orbital tumors. Over to you, Dr. Seema. I'm going to stop the share. Thank you, Farooz. And uh, is my screen visible? Not yet. Okay. It's visible now? Yes. OK. So uh, to begin this, uh, I see on uh, pediatric ocular tumors, I'll be talking about uh, orbital tumors in children. And this is a topic uh, very difficult to cover in 10 minutes. So I'll just stick to uh, some common scenarios and a few uncommon scenarios that we see in the clinics. So we all know the classification. It can arise from any structure in the orbit, um, right from the blood vessels, from the glandular structures, muscles. And uh, these are the kind of lesions that we commonly see, the benign ones, uh, the dermoid cyst, the external ones, uh, which could be in any location, the external angular being the uh, commonest one. It can be internal angular, can be in the inferior orbit. Sometimes it can be down, deep down into the orbit also. Usually taken out, uh, treated by a simple surgical excision and the external walls can easily be taken care of by a hidden incision, either by a lid crease or by an interval approach. Uh, sometimes uh, even the simple dermoids can actually uh, cause a little trouble for us and can uh, present in a little unusual way. So this was a small child and these are the pictures which has been captured by the parents and all they noticed at birth was a small dimple which this baby had. Uh, in the temporal part around the eye. It was asymptomatic for some time except for the small dimple and then they noticed uh, sometimes there used to be a little bit of you know discharge coming out from that small pit uh, next to the eyebrow. As the child grew up she started getting these repeat, repeated episodes of inflammation of the eyelids orbit which were being treated as uh, sometimes sty preceptal cellulitis uh, sometimes with this uh, discharge in the eye was also treated as NLD block, congenital NLD block. Now, uh, subsequently, this was the picture that area, the skin around that small pit started breaking down after these repeat, repeated bouts of inflammation. And then she had this uh, chronic uh, discharge from that pit. So when we saw her, this is how she was. There was this uh, cellulitis kind of picture, seemed something like a small abscess around the temporal part of the eyelid. And this small pit was... Uh, a small sinus, in fact, was visible with little ooze from that. So when we got the CT, uh, this was what we saw. There was a visible bony um, abnormality here. It's almost like a fossa formation. And there was this uh, cystic mass lesion in the lateral orbit. And we can see the small area of the bony discontinuity through which it was probably communicating in the temporal fossa. And that's how this small sinus had formed. And uh, subsequently, when she got these inflammatory episodes, it actually increased in size. This was the imaging done during one of those episodes, showing an increased collection with a lot of inflammation in the temporal aspect. And here we can see the small bony uh, defect uh, uh, very clearly. So this was something like what we call as a double variety of dermoid, uh, where sometimes we don't see a very obvious uh, mass lesion, like a cystic lesion, which is the typical uh, imaging appearance, but the patient can actually present with repeated bouts of inflammation uh, with uh, subsequent fistula formation. This was another patient who had 
been treated elsewhere once, excision was done, but subsequently he started having this repeated inflammation from the skin uh, and this small uh, oozing discharge. So this was a residual dermoid, which uh, probably part of it, the part which was inside the orbit was left behind. And that's what uh, caused this recurrent inflammation. Now, an MRI was initially done for this patient. This was the pre-op MRI before the initial excision. And we can see this cystic lesion very nicely, superficial one. But what we cannot see here is the bony defect, the involvement of the bone and the dumbbell can and be missed. The part which is extending into the bone can be missed if we just rely on an MRI. So CT could be a better imaging modality in this situation where it can show us uh, the uh, situation, what is going on inside a little better. Uh, some more uh, rare presentations where uh, repeated bouts of inflammation <coughs> from the dermoid can also cause cicatricial changes of the eyelid with cicatricial lag of thalamus, sometimes atropian, and this patient needs to be, uh, uh, this abnormality also needs to be corrected along with excision of the dermoid, like in this patient. So these are the intraosseous dermoid. So this child was referred to us with the diagnosis of an orbital retinoblastoma, but if we see this eye, this actually looks like an orbital mass with a lot of uh, conjunctival inflammation, hemorrhage, bleed, crust, erosion, but if we see the um, other eye, we know what the diagnosis is. So this is a microphthalmus in the right eye with a um, probably a clinical anophthalmus eye in the left side with an orbitopalpable cyst and the imaging clearly gives us the diagnosis. So many a time because of the exposure, because of the conjunctival inflammation, they can mimic as orbital mass and sometimes can be misdiagnosed. Uh, a simple aspiration with a sclerotherapy, with a sclerosing agent can actually um, take care of uh, this pathology and this patient subsequently can be fitted with a prosthetic eye. Now, hemangioma, we all know uh, a lot about capillary hemangioma. The treatment has changed from interrelational steroid injection to excision to propranolol, now being the first line of uh, treatment modality with very good uh, uh, response to treatment. We also now have uh, several reports where uh, efficacy of topical beta blockers has been shown to be uh, very useful in this superficial lesion specifically. Uh, there are also reports of VEGF re receptors being present in this orbital vascular malformation and possibly there could be a role of anti-VEGFs in this patient, which we uh, might know subsequently as uh, more reports come up. Now, lymphatic malformation, sometimes they do present to us with an orbital cellulitis kind of picture, can get misdiagnosed as cellulitis, sometimes as uh, orbital abscess. And uh, uh, imaging can give uh, the diagnosis where we see a fairly well-defined uh, sort of lesion with cystic or the collection inside and rest of the orbit seems to be pretty quiet, uh, which is unusual in cases of an orbital cellulitis with abscess. Aspiration will uh, definitely give us a diagnosis. And again, sclerotherapy uh, with various sclerosing agents works very well in this patient. Uh, there are again now reports of use of mTOR inhibitor, the serolimus specifically, which are basically uh, the... VEGF and mTOR are the uh, pathways which are involved in angiogenesis and lymphogenesis and inhibiting those pathways can have a role in treatment of this patient. What we definitely know is the classification now, the new ISVA classification based on which we need to classify. And if we have to classify this lesion based on the ISVA, we need to have the proper imaging modality. And for most of this patient, the best ima imaging modality remains a dynamic uh, MRI, uh, which can tell us whether it's uh, essentially a venous or a lymphatic or a predominantly arterial sort of uh, malformation. So it's important to distinguish between the two because we know in a, uh, in a venous or a lymphatic uh, venous malformation is the size of the outflow channel, which is the most important determinant uh, on, of, of what imaging, what treatment modality we are going to choose and what is going to be the prognosis. And in arterial is the size of the inflow and the needle size, which is the most important determinant. A Valsalva is a very useful test, which can give us some idea about the outflow channel and a definite increase in Valsalva, like in this patient, is an indicator that there is going to be a definite uh, big feeder channel behind and that needs to be taken care of and the simple sclerotherapy with a direct injection into the uh, lesion um, uh, without any guidance might not be a very good option. Now, while we're talking about this uh, vascular malformation, which can sometimes present with bleed, this was one child who came to us, this was sometime last year during the lockdown period with this uh, lot of bleeding around the periorbital area, a lot of necrosis of the eyelid skin, uh, massive proptosis, the eye was sort of uh, a non-seeing eye. And initially, uh, the initial blood investigation did show thrombocytopenia. 
So we initially thought it could be an ITP sort of some vascular, uh, some uh, um, sort of, you know, um, hematological um, uh, sort of abnormality. Since rest of the things were parameters were normal, just thrombocytopenia, we thought it could be a bleed associated with the thrombocytopenia kind of thing. And his imaging did show this um, fairly oil defined anterior orbital mass lesion, which was enhancing very uh, nicely with contrast. However, since he was not improving the conventional treatment and uh, subsequent imaging with the PET CT showed some other lesion in the lungs and the lymph nodes, we went ahead with the biopsy and biopsy showed small round cells. And these were the uh, immunomarkers positive for CD3, 45, 99, um, which ultimately was suggestive of a diagnosis of NK T cell, non Hodgkin's lymphoma. So, and T cell lymphomas, especially the NK cells lymphomas, are very unusual in the orbit. Mostly what we saw. And especially in children, are the uh, um, though it's very rare, lymphomas are not very common in children, but what we saw are mostly the B-cell ones. So now this patient is, did respond to the chemotherapy regime. Uh, the eye did respond well, but subsequently he landed up with a relapse, the vitreous relapse in the other eye, and this skin lesion then started coming up of the cutaneous lymphoma, and uh, finally he actually succumbed to the disease. We could not um, sort of, you know, the treatment was not effective. So these patients do carry a very poor prognosis. They're aggressive tumors, and we need to know that sometimes they can present with a cellulitis, inflammation, or a hemorrhage kind of picture, and we need to have a very high suspicion, do biopsy wherever required. And these are not simply um, hemorrhage, orbital hemorrhage, though sometimes uh, they can present with thrombocytopenia and other uh, blood abnormality. Another patient was initially diagnosed as a conjunctival calysis, was being uh, treated somewhere else with topical steroid lubricants for some time, did not subside, uh, worsened. This was the picture when we saw her, a lot of thickening on the conjunctiva. This was definitely not a conjunctival um, calysis or an inflammation of the conjunctiva, which usually does not happen in a child, especially unilateral. And biopsy gave us the diagnosis. The blast cells, which we could see even in the incision biopsy specimen, and subsequently, even on the peripheral smear, we could see the uh, blood cells. So, this was an acute lymphoblastic leukemia, lymphoma, what we call them, which presented as a conjunctive uh -huh. unusual. So, uh, Ferus, do I have time or should I stop? Prima, we have time. Okay. How's the discussion? So we can yes, two minutes more. Yeah. Two no, minutes. Go ahead. So leukemia commonly presents with this kind of picture, rapidly progressing proptosis, but some most of many a times it could be a little atypical presentation, like in this child, presenting like a sinoorbital mass, and the initial peripheral smear did not show anything, but subsequent biopsy did pick up the diagnosis of the leukemia. Another patient presenting with a lacrimal gland mass, which we thought could be a lacrimal gland tumor, and we know that ACC can present in a younger age group, but, uh, uh, but since the suspicion was a little high and this was rapidly progressing, we initially did a peripheral smear and it actually picked up the blast cells and subsequently was diagnosed as an uh, acute myeloid leukemia and uh, this was, she is currently in remission and this is the current picture. Now, just two more cases of fungating mass. When you talk of fungating mass, this is the picture we very commonly see, and we all know what, what it is. Orbital retinoblastoma presenting with a fungating mass. A similar child, again, we saw in the last year, presenting with a fungating orbital mass. The initial impression looks like an orbital RB, but when you did the imaging, we see that there is nothing in the globe. It's an, essentially an orbital mass. Now, this is what we saw in biopsy. Uh, uh, alveolar sort of pattern with a lot of loose myxoid stroma and the immuno which was done was suggest was positive for cell 4 and AFP, alpha fetoprotein. And we know that with these immunomarkers, they're very, very diagnostic of orbit, uh, yolk sac tumor. Um, but what was surprising was that she did not have any other systemic abnormality or systemic workup did not show anything in the abdomen and it was ultimately diagnosed as a primary orbital yolk sac tumor uh, where very few cases are reported in the literature. The response to the chemo is very good in these patients as we see here. It almost resolved completely the orbital mass and one year down the follow-up this is what her picture is. Another fungating orbital mass. So again, this is not a retinal blastoma as we see here. And what uh, the imaging is very, very unusual, a solid component along with a huge cystic component. But the solid component, the shape is something what we know that could be there in other tumor that is uh, an optic nerve glioma. So in this patient, we, we aspirated the cystic contents uh, and also did an incision biopsy and on uh, the at the squash imprint slide, this is what we saw, the fusiform cigar shaped cells with uh, cytoplasmic processes, the dendritic-like cytoplasmic processes, which was quite diagnostic of an optic nerve glioma. 
uh, a low grade one. So normally glioma is present like this, but unusual presentation like a fungating mass with a lot of cystic degeneration can also be there. Uh, this is how we commonly see the Ewing spinity, primarily a bone-based tumor with a lot of bone destruction with an orbital involvement, maxillary uh, area is commonly involved. But this was another child we very recently saw with a little bit of maxillary fullness here, inferior orbital mass lesion with a temporal mass lesion, imaging showing a triradiate kind of picture, but there was involvement of the maxilla. This is literal inferior, not superior, like we see the classical triradiate involved with the sphenoid bone. And I don't have the histopathy yet for this child, but on uh, incision biopsy, it showed a malignant round cell tumor, which were positive for NSE, CD56, synaptopycin, and CGA, which are uh, kind of, you know, confirms the diagnostic, diagnosis of a neuroblastoma. Again, what was unusual was that this child did not have anything else on systemic workup. Abdomen was clear, which is very, very unusual. Normally, how this is how we see neuroblastomas, the raccoon eyes that we call bilateral periorbital uh, ecchymosis, bilateral orbital masses, the triradiates are quite common, but sometimes we can see a quite orbital mass unilateral without systemic involvement like we saw in this child. So this was what uh, was about some common and some co uncommon orbital uh, tumors in children. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Seema. That was an excellent presentation on uh, touching up on almost every tumors uh, in pediatric age group that, uh, you know, every ophthalmologist and specialist should be knowing. Thank you so much for covering it in detail. May I request Dr. Vikas Menon uh, to talk on uh, ocular adenexial tumors in children, including eyelid and conjunctiva. Over to you, Dr. Vikas Menon. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pairus, uh, for including me in your course. Uh, Dr. Seema has uh, showed a plethora of very interesting orbital cases. And uh, in some of my slides, you may see some overlap between the entities. So I will just... Uh, so my, my area is pediatric eyelid and conjunctival lesions and uh, briefly I will mention about when to intervene in these conditions. So in the coming few minutes, what we are going to see is uh, some of these conditions which are the most common conjunctival and eyelid tumors in children uh, like choristomatous lesions, we will see some melanocytic lesions, we will also see some vascular lesions, benign epithelial lesions and uh, some of the malignant lesions. Mostly malignant lesions which appear in eyelid and conjunctiva are actually primarily coming from the orbit and not very rarely they arise primarily from the conjunctiva or lid tissues. Mostly they are coming from the orbit as Dr. Seema has just shown. So let us begin with this. Yeah. So the first, uh, or one of the most common conjunctival choristomas or the conjunctival lesions that we see in pediatric age group is this. So most of us would recognize what it is. It's basically a yellowish, whitish kind of a firm mass, which is uh, kind of straddling across the limbus, encroaching onto the cornea. And we know that this is nothing but a limbal dermoid. Now, limbal dermoids are fairly common. And uh, so, uh, and when do we treat them? Un unless they are causing some lo a lot of cosmetic deformity, they are very extensive, causing amblyopia. We generally do not do anything about them, but in case they are leading to a lot of astigmatism or a lot of uh, functional problems or patients are very cosmetically conscious, then these dermoids can be excised and one has to be careful that they may have a deeper extension into the cornea at that point of time. The cornea surgeon also has to be ready for a possible lamellar keratoplasty if required. Now, basically, choristomas, what are choristomas? Choristomas are nothing but a bunch of normal cells, normal tissue but which is uh, present at an abnormal site where it is not supposed to be present. The next common type of choristoma that we see is dermolipoma. Now, dermolipoma again is something which is present since childhood and uh, parents usually bring the child because of cosmetic reasons or they feel that, you know, there is this fleshy mass. It usually appears as a yellowish kind of a mass in the lateral fornix mostly. And what you see on closer examination is maybe you sometimes see fine hair follicles or fine whitish hair growing on the surface of the lesion. Basically, the color is yellowish and at, in areas there may be a whitish kind of a due to these lesions. They may be very small, hidden in the fornix where they don't cause any cosmetic problem. But in a situation like this where uh, the dermolipoma is significantly large, there in those cases, you can actually debulk the anterior most part of the uh, dermolipoma, which is causing the cosmetic problem. And uh, you can actually excise this anterior most part 
cover the bare area with an amniotic membrane graft which can be sutured or fixed with a amniot uh, with this piprin glue and usually these lesions heal very well with a good cosmesis ultimately uh these are epibulbar osseous choristomas this is nothing but a, a, a kind of a piece of bone which is present on over the sclera and it's stuck on the sclera so it does not cause any problem and it's present since birth mostly and patients usually do not know uh, till late un unless they start palpating their eyes and most of the patients will come uh, with just that thing that you know they are palpating something abnormal in their eye eye and uh, so if you look at it the most common location is this area which is suprotemporal location and sometimes patients may complain of grittiness or irritation in the eyes if you do a scan you will see some calcification like a bone would give and simply if you excise them you will just get a piece of calcified mass and nothing else it does not cause any other functional problem as such now complex choristomas are choristomas basically which are little um in the sense that they have a they have heterogeneous tissue within them now the earlier choristomas that we saw was like having purely bone or having just fat but here in complex choristoma the difference is that these complex choristomas have uh, uh, they can have a mixture of different types of cells within them so they may have fat cells you may find lacrimal gland tissue ectopic or you may find even cartilage or bone in them so they will have more than one type of tissue in them if you excise and send them for histopathology the only significance of complex choristoma is that sometimes they may be uh, associated with a rare syndrome which is called nevus sebaceous of jadasson which may be associated with some cns uh, uh, signs like seizures or mental retardation or things like that those patients also have typical facial patches of the uh, nevi on the face but it's a rare rare thing to see so moving on to epithelial conjunctival lesions now this is again one of the commonest type of epithelial conjunctival lesion that we see in children what you see here is basically a frond like growth happening in the inferior fornix of a child and these are multiple lesions that you see here uh, so what is this this is nothing but uh, uh, this is just nothing but a papilloma so if you excise them simply there are chances that they can recur so while excising them you have to be careful that you also cryo the adjacent areas and practice a no touch technique whereby you don't hold these region directly with your forceps otherwise you may end up uh, seeding the rest of the conjunctiva with the uh, what is called as, as hpv which which has been um, kind of found to be culprit behind these lesions and these patients in such situations may have more recurrences so cryotherapy as an adjunct is helpful still some patients have recurrences even though you may take all the precautions but and in those patients interferon eye drops or mitomycin c eye drops have been tried with some success and uh, oral cimetidine has also been given in situations like this now primary ossn or ocular surface squamous neoplasia is extremely rare in children or in pediatric age group but this is an exception we all know what this is this is zero derma pigmentosa now this is a condition which may predispose even younger children to develop ocular surface squamous neoplasias and uh, this child this patient uh, this child came to us with bilateral ossn in fact one of the eye had gone into thysis and the other eye also had florid growth on the surface of the eye now this is one situation if you see a patient with zero derma pigmentosa you need to be a little careful in their examination uh, probably this eye could have been saved if it, if the disease was detected early on The next common thing that we see in pediatric age group is melanocytic conjunctival tumors. The most common being nevus, and nevus is what nothing but a a, a patch of pigmentation which is relatively well defined. It may be slightly elevated, uh, present near the limbus in the interpalpebral fissure with, and sometimes you may see these small uh, feeder vessels. Uh, nothing to be scared of those feeder vessels. They don't implicate an, a malignancy here in this situation. They are very fine feeder vessels. and if you see these micro cysts within the lesion which may be seen in 60% of these lesions then uh, you can be reasonably certain that you know what you are seeing is a benign lesion and nothing and not a malignant one uh, and if you still have any doubts you can do an oct to identify these micro cysts and uh, you can get a clear idea these are the typical locations where nevi can occur in the interpalpebral fissure near the limbus it may occur on the plica or on the carunculus as well 
these nevi carry less than 1% risk of malignant transformation and mostly it is when uh, they become very dark in color or are present in adulthood or there are multiple recurrences now nevi can also be amelanotic at times which which may be difficult to diagnose but if you see cystic lesions sometimes in these lesions uh, cystic areas then you know possibly that it's a amelanotic lesion nevi sorry so next is melanocytosis oculodermal melanocytosis uh is an extension of this ocular melanocytosis where the pigmentation also spills over to the skin side now in melanocytosis the conjunctiva is normal but the pigmentation is confined to the sclera or episclera what is important here is that you need to screen these patients for presence of uveal melanoma which may occur in almost 1 to 400 patients you may also see some pigmentation on the palate or near the hairline and these patients are predisposed to hypophagial and skin uh, meningeal melanomas as well So this is something which Dr. Sima had shown: venal lymphatic malformations, and uh, sometimes you may see the, an extension of these under the conjunctiva. This has already been covered. Next common thing is pyogenic granuloma. Pyogenic granuloma is actually not a true tumor, but rather an exuberant uh, fibrovascular response to a previous insult over the of the conjunctiva, either caused by surgery or a previous infection or a foreign body on the surface. lymphoid conjunctival tumors most of the times what we see in children are benign this patient presented with a medial uh, pernicial mass which was pinkish in color and uh, uh, if it was in an adult patient or elderly patient the chances would have been of lymphoma but in children more chances are that it would be a benign thing it was excised and turned out to be a, a benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia although dr seema has shown some rare cases of lymphomas also but those are relatively rare more common you will see benign lymphoid hyperplasia covering some eyelid uh, tumors now dermoid cysts already dr seema has shown that the superficial eyelid cysts may appear to deform the eyelids and may appear as a cosmetic blemish where you can remove them simply uh, through a cosmetically hidden lid crease incision the uh, classification also dr seema just mentioned that this for classification has kind of changed the way we view these uh, hemangiomatous lesions or vascular lesions on the eyelids and on the conjunctiva so this patient was of just uh, one minute more seema uh, dr fairus no so problem hemangiomas uh, are those which grow over a period of time and uh, then after a few years they gradually start subsiding propranolol works wonders for these kids and this was a child who presented uh, with extensive facial hemangioma and this is after a few months of oral propranolol you can see that the intensity of the lesion has reduced another syndromic variation of these venous malformation on the face is seen as sturge weber syndrome where you see a diffuse port wine stain on the eyelid and also the forehead and the side of nose what is important is you need to screen these patients for presence of diffuse choroidal hemangioma which may at time be subtle and difficult to diagnose unless you are specifically looking for it or unless it has got uh, subretinal fluid which can cause a decrease of vision so uh, if there is there are subtle changes you may do an oct and find that the choroidal vessels can be seen to be very enlarged on the affected side as compared to this is the normal side of the same patient this is an uh, this is the iswa classification venal lymphatic malformation already dr seema has covered so i'll not go into those AV malformations, Dr. Sima has covered. Again, you need to be careful of these high flow malformations. Don't treat them as a venous lymphat, venous lymphatic or low flow malformation. Otherwise, there can be a lot of bleeding, which may be difficult to handle. The other benign lesion that occurs on the eyelids is neurofibromatosis. Now, this is a child with a plexiform neurofibromatosis, a uh, plexiform neurofibroma of the eyelid, and uh, you can also see other signs of neurofibroma on these patients. So the treatment here is uh, debulking, and we, what we follow is a modified template technique, which was initially uh, suggested by Dr. Honawar, and has been modified a little bit as to include the excise the lateral part of the lid, and then we anchor the lateral part of tarsus to the periorbita to give a slightly better cosmetic outcome. Only thing that you need to counsel these parents, the parents of these children, as to need for possible multiple surgeries. Uh, as the neurofibroma also can grow as the child grows up rhabdomyosarcoma sometimes may appear yes, as sure child printed as yeah yeah last slide so yeah. this may appear as a lump on the eyelid this also dr seema has shown but most of these malignancies will have some orbital component 
So to summarize what we saw were some choristomas, some examples of pigmented conjunctival and lead lesions, some examples of vascular malformations and neurofibromas and malignancies. Now these are the lesions which you, you would come across most often in the pediatric age group. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pipes. Thank you very much, Dr. Vikas. In the outset, I would like to uh, welcome Dr. Paul T. Finger, who's in, uh, in the faculty here, in the panel over here, and he will be having his keynote lecture at the end of the session. Welcome, Dr. Paul T. Finger, on behalf of All India Ophthalmological Society, Scientific Committee, and our uh, session uh, team. Thank you, Peruz. It's a pleasure to be here and listen to all these interesting lectures. All right, thank you very, very much. So may I request Dr. Usha Kim, uh, who is the head of oculoplasty and ocular oncology at Arvind Eye Care Madurai. Uh, Ma'am, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much, Fairuz. I will. Yeah, the slides are visible and I'm audible, right? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so we'll be talking about the uh, a little change in the gears and moving towards genetics and counseling, which is a very relevant at this point of time. So uh, we all know that uh, retinoblastoma is caused by the neural retina specific alteration of the RB1 gene and inactivation of both the alleles are necessary for the RB for retinoblastoma formation. Now, there are a few points that we need to remember. Tumors can be caused by genetic aberrations, but all patients need not inherit the disease. Tumors need not be inherited in all cases by the next generation as well. These two points are very relevant. Some tumors are caused by RB1 mutation, while others by amplification of the Meckin gene. Now, let's look at what heritable does. There is a high risk of other cancers and heritable uh, entity. There's an increased risk of retinoblastoma in siblings and offspring, and the alterations are often identified in blood. Whereas the non-heritable entity, there is no risk of other cancers, reduced risk of uh, retinoblastoma in siblings and offspring, and usually the alterations are identified only in the tumor. These are the gross points that we need to keep in mind. Now, what we did was we had about 1,500 cases which we plotted and established the stepwise method for RB1 analysis through Sanger sequencing for known point mutations, which is already existing, 90% being somatic and germline. Then we did the MLPA for deletions and duplications and MSMLPA for uh, somatic changes. This is what we uh, initially started with. So the next generation sequencing facility helped us identify new pathogenic variants in RB1, which could not be identified by the conventional methods. Now, on uh, plotting the spectrum, we found out uh, about 20 new novel mutations, which were very specific to our part of the country. And about 38% was nonsense mutations and about uh, a few was uh, deletions, but we did find a lot of indels, missense, splice, deletions, duplications, a lot of these were present, but 20 of them were novel, very specific to our part of the world. Now, what was the timeline taken? We did take about three weeks from the time of acquiring the specimen, which could be either blood or the a tumor sp a specimen and generate the results and provide counseling at the end of uh, three to four weeks, which is the time when the patients come for follow-up after the first visit. Now, a complete genetic testing protocol is established, leading to a sensitivity of about 95% for somatic mutations and 90% for germline mutations in bilateral RB patients' blood. On the basis, on this basis, we were able to bring down the cost to about 16,000 rupees, which is equivalent of about uh, $250 US dollars. So what all were we able to acquire? I'll take you through. Uh, each of these case scenarios. We could identify familial RB, twin discordance, de novo germline mutation, somatic RB, and prenatal testing also was made available. Now let's look at this uh, particular scenario where the proband presented at four months. There was bilateral RB, mother was, uh, right eye was enucleated. <clears throat> Subsequent follow-up, mother was pregnant. So we had asked, we had found out that they had the mother and the first 
child had the same mutation. So we had educated the mother to bring the child as early as possible for the next baby. And the 12 day old sibling was brought to the clinic with group B retinoblastoma, both eyes and the child, unfortunately, unfortunately had the same mutation and we were able to treat the child early, not only saving the life of the patient, but and the eye of the patient, but also the vision could be salvaged in that particular patient. So next scenario was a proband presented at 36 months. There's no family history. It was a unilateral RB group E, but germline mutation was identified in blood. So we know that the offspring has to be careful. Now next was a unilateral a proband presented at 26 months with a uh, right eye group E uh, tumor. There was a germline mutation identified and the child was closely monitored. It turned to be bilateral retinoblastoma during the treatment period. An analysis of the patient showed that the father was an unaffected carrier. And so we had to predict a higher risk for the next sibling. So this was a father's blood, proband's blood, and the proband tumor showed the same mutation. So, but the father was unaffected. Now this is a three-year-old male with group E left eye with an, a, a retinal detachment. There's no family history. We did an enucleation for this particular patient and there was homozygous methylation only in proband's tumor. So it was only in the tumor and not in the blood. Now in the older patients, patients started coming to us. The older patients who were survivors, they started coming to us asking for risks. So in one patient, there was a, a unilateral retinoblastoma which was enucleated about 20 some years ago. There's no family history of retinoblastoma. But, and then we could identify that there was no mutation found in the patient's blood. And so we predicted a less than 1% chance of getting RB in her offspring. Another patient who had a unilateral RB with no family history again, there was no mutation identified in the blood. And we were able to predict no risk of secondary tumors due to RB1 germline mutation. Now, another 20-year-old female with unilateral RB enucleated uh, at one year of age. The genetic testing showed germline mutation, which is heritable. That is, heterozygous whole RB1 gene deletion was identified in the proband. Uh, and so, there was a chance of uh, the offspring getting affected. <coughs> Excuse me. 24-year-old female again, unilateral, enucleated at two years of age, no family history. Heritable nonsense mutation was identified. You can see that. And again, there is a chance of the offspring being affected. So in another scenario where uh, four uh, affected members were there in a particular family, the proband's wife was pregnant uh, and uh, the proband and the mother had heterozygous deletion of uh, exons 3 to 13. So we did a prenatal testing after the amniocentesis was done for the proband's fetus and same deletion was found in the fetal DNA as well. So it had to go in for termination, which was left to the discretion of the patients. So then we started identifying the copy number gain and loss. Uh, and then apart from the genetic changes, epigenetic alterations are also relevant. So we do the whole genome level epigenetic changes are being studied. And uh, now we also try to understand the mechanism of chemo resistance, <clears throat> especially in some of the cases which are resilient to treatment. Now, uh, we do see that there is a distinct cell differentiation pattern in chemosensitive and chemoresistant retinoblastoma. Increased expression of stem cell markers in non-responsive eyes provide the evidence for us that there is involvement of cancer uh, stem cells in therapeutic resistance. Now, there is also one significant factor that we found out that somatic uh, mutations were frequent in RB patients with parents of an age difference of less than 10 years. And de novo germline mutations were frequent in RB patients with parents of an age difference of more than 10 years. This was something which we found out in our data. So to summarize, identification of the RB1 germline status of a patient allows differentiation between sporadic and heritable. Genetic testing and genetic counseling is crucial for assessing short-term risk of additional tumors in the same eye and other eye and also helps in prognosticating and long-term risk of non-ocular malignant tumors as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Virus, for this wonderful opportunity, especially to be amongst all the leaders in ocular oncology. Thank you very much.
Ma'am, thank you very, very much for sharing such an enormous data from Arvind I Care on genetics of retinoblastoma. We will be taking more questions in the end with you. And congratulations on this excellent work. Dear Cyrus, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, may I request our next speaker, Dr. Anirban Baduri, who's an ocular oncologist uh, in West Bengal, and he will be talking to us regarding retinoblastoma, the non masquerade, the known masquerader in children. And uh, he does a lot of work on retinoblastoma. So he's the right person to talk to us on this. Over to you, Dr. Anirpan. Thank you, Fairuz, for your introduction. Thank you very much for including me in this August gathering. Uh, are my slides visible? Uh, yes. They are? Yeah, okay. if, if you want to go to the presentation uh, mode, if you want to click full screen, Dr. Anirpan. Yeah, what I'm not able to. It's in the bottom of your uh, PPT. I'll navigate. You can find the 70 person there, bottom, come down. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Uh, retinoblastoma see, uh, is a mimic. And uh, when Cyrus asked Peter to talk about masquerade, we all, as ophthalmologists, know that masquerade is when a disease mimics another disease, a, a less malignant condition. But looking further into the word masquerade, brought me to this situation where you had these mask balls. And that was what a masquerade originally was, where people could pretend to be what they were not, just like retinoblastoma pretending to be something else. And this brings me to the story of this four-year-old child who presented like this. And it's a tragic story. And uh, part of the purpose of this presentation is not to let this happen. So this child was diagnosed with endophthalmitis in a particular place. And this child underwent a vitrectomy along with intravitreal antibiotics and he wouldn't get better. So he was taken to another place where they decided that there was nothing that could be done and they did an evisceration. And this is a month later. And we keep coming across these scenarios where intraocular surgery has been done on a patient simply because the child doesn't present the way a retinoblastoma is usually known to present. So this is something we are all very familiar with. Most of the patients that we see have leukocoria. Leukocoria could be because of other causes, but then everyone knows that if you see leukocoria, please rule out retinoblastoma. And for us in India or in Africa, this is again a scenario we are fairly familiar with. A child presenting with a fungating mask. Seema showed something very unusual where there was an orbital lesion which uh, mimicked this retinoblastoma presentation. But most of us are fairly familiar with this one presentation. But what about the other presentations? The other presentations that mislead us into thinking that the child is probably suffering from something else. And I've just listed a few of them. Squaring glaucoma, ocular inflammation, hemorrhages in the eye, inflammation in the orbit, and even thysis bulbi. Uh, this is uh, all of us, most of us here uh, have trained in LB Prasad with Dr. Hunavar. And this is a paper that came out with uh, uh, data from Swati, where they found that 75% of children who are presented to the institute presented with leukocoria. Around 5% presented with squint. And 6% presented either with an enlarged globe or proptosis. And there in descending order, there are other... So around 25% of patients present with a scenario other than a leukocoria. So let's look at some of them. Uh, this is a child who primarily has a squint. If you look very carefully, there is leukocoria. If you ask your parent, uh, the ch parents of your children who come to you, many of them actually had a squint before they developed a leukocoria. So if we sensitize parents, if we sensitize our pediatric ophthalmologists and our uh, other ophthalmology colleagues, but if you see a squid, please dilate the child, look at the macula. It isn't difficult, and you might actually pick up retinoblastoma there. So, this is the other scenario where you have a child. We are quite uh, familiar with seeing children presenting with atropian uvia, NVI, 
and raised intraocular pressure, but they can also present with a more advanced form with Bufthalmos, where they even have Habstria. But again, all of us need to be aware that these patients may be harboring retinoblastoma, and it's a good idea to do an ultrasound and rule out retinoblastoma before you go ahead. Dr. Santosh keeps showing us pictures of children who've undergone a tuberculectomy with a metastasis coming on later. Okay, this is another scenario where you see a white hypopion in an eye which is quiet. Now that should ring alarm bells. Why should an eye be quiet? GRA is not very commonly seen among our ophthalmologic colleagues. And this is a child who has a retinoblastoma. You can see the shifting fluid inside the anterior chamber. And if you do a slit lamp examination, you will find that these cells are larger. They're actually clumps of cells. And this hypopion is white unlike what you see with a hypopion resulting from an infection. Now, again, an ultrasound itself would have helped make a diagnosis. This is a rarer presentation. Seema sent me these pictures of one of our patients. We do see patients with diffuse infiltrating retinoblastoma who often present with this scenario, where they have iris nodules, where they have a pseudo hypopion. But those are fairly easy to diagnose because they have fundus lesions which are picked up ultrasound features which are picked up. But this is a patient where the fundus appeared normal, the central fundus. This was a scan which did not show anything significant in the eye. And this is a UA finding. So this is one of our fundus pictures with an endoscope, which shows a very peripheral tumor here. And as she is drawn here, there are per small peripheral tumors and involvement of the past plana as well. And now if you look carefully at this CT scan that was ordered, you see a tiny mass here. Difficult to say whether this is calcification, but definitely there is a mass now that you look at it in hindsight. Okay. This is again a presentation. Uh, this is a child who had undergone a anterior chamber paracentesis to drain out the hemorrhage. And after the blood was drained, the gentleman who did it found that there was something else lurking behind the lens and that is how the patient came. But this is the ultrasound. So the ultrasound shows that there is a mass lesion with calcification. And uh, we need our colleagues to go, and go back and look at the ultrasounds. And this is the other eye. So if the child had been seen under anesthesia and the other eye had been examined before jumping into doing a Hyphema drainage, the, the, the diagnosis would not have been missed. And this is the MRI of the child, which clearly shows on T1 imaging tumor in the left eye. The right eye is smaller with hemorrhage and tumor filling the eye. Vitreous hemorrhage is again one of the less common presentations, but here you can see other signs. You can see the tumor mass lesion here. You can see the ectropian uvia along with the NVI. Again, an ultrasound would have picked up the diagnosis. This is a child who's presented with a cataract, but you can see the vitreous, the iris nodules here, large iris nodules. And this is a child who's had cataract surgery. And there was a vitreous hemorrhage behind, which is when this child gets referred. And this child, again, had retinoblastoma in the other eye as well, which was missed. Okay. Child presenting with Inflammation, I showed you the first patient where the child had undergone a vitrectomy. This is another child who has inflammation. He has vitreous hemorrhage. He has a little bit of hyphema as well. And, and a child who has presented with this leg swelling, there is proptosis, diminished eye movements, chemosis, typical of an orbital cellulitis. We need to be aware that these kids could also be harboring a retinoblastoma. And then an ultrasound simply shows you the intraocular mass lesion with the calcification within the mass. And this is typical of a necrotic retinoplastoma presenting with sterile orbital inflammation. To summarize, retinoplastoma is a great mimic and it is important, extremely important to suspect retinoplastoma in the atypical presentations. So every child presenting to an ophthalmologist with squint, glaucoma, red eye, proptosis, orbital cellulitis, even thysis, we need to first rule out retinoblastoma. We just need to be aware that retinoblastoma can be present in such eyes. And all you need to do is a good 
proper evaluation, examination of both the eyes under anesthesia, imaging it. We all have access to ultrasound B scan. And for most of these patients, in most of these scenarios, an ultrasound itself would have picked up the telltale signs. And for God's sake, please do not proceed for any intraocular surgery without ruling out retinoplastoma in these cases. Timely diagnosis and referral holds the key to survival for these children. Thank you, Farooz. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Anirban, and especially putting that point very loud and clear, the crucial points where, you know, a child might be harboring an intraocular retinoblastoma, and it's very, very important to rule it out before you go in for an intraocular procedure. Thank you very much for the excellent uh, case uh, series of various masquerades. Uh, I, I now invite Dr. Uh, Santosh Hunava, who is a mentor of all of us over here. He is involved in another session also. So he's going to talk about uh, the life salvage in orbital rhabdomyosarcoma. Over to you, Dr. Santosh. Thank you so much, Paris. I'll be talking about uh, orbital rhabdomyosarcoma, which is a most common primary malignant orbital tumor in children. And it's the most common head and neck soft tissue sarcoma as well, and arises from the pluripotent missing time. Generally seen in the first decade of life and uh, presents mainly with subacute proptosis that worsens in weeks, not in days. That is a common presentation in about 90% of children in our series with downward and outward displacement of the eye. That is the most typical presentation because tumor is generally located in the superior, slightly towards the supranasal aspect. That was in 70%. This is one of the manifestations where a patient presented with a fleshy superior phonicial mass. And when we do MRI, you see a superior orbital lesion in close association with superior rectus LPS complex and ptosis. This is a presentation of a botryoid variant of rhabdomyosarcoma in the inferior phonix. Now uh, on CT scan, it presents as a uniformly enhancing isodens well circumscribed lesion. It's fairly well circumscribed as you see, but it is friable when you do surgery with no bone involvement, but excavation is present. As compared to the other side, you can see that there is a gentle excavation of the supranasal orbital wall, contouring is present, and very rarely there might be intralesional cyst formation that is mainly because of necrosis, and that may have variegated presentation. This is an MRI appearance of uh, rhabdomyosarcoma, where uh, its intensity is slightly darker to the brain tissue. It's almost similar to the brain tissue. Now, these are the differential diagnosis, granulocytic sarcoma, where a child may have uh, subacute proptosis. This child has subconjunctival hemorrhage and also had rot spots in the fundus. This is a child with non-African Burkitt's lymphoma with uh, intracranial extension. Severe inflammation and lymphangioma with intralational bleed can also mimic rhabdomyosarcoma. The first step that we take when we have a patient with rhabdomyosarcoma is to do an in incisional biopsy. Like this child who has a superior orbital mass, we perform a multi-layered incisional biopsy. Just to show that superficial biopsy in this child showed only inflammation and fibrosis. And the deeper biopsy showed the tumor that is embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma, which was desmin and myoglobin positive. So when you have a round cell tumor in children, there is an element of necrosis. The deepest component of the tumor may have uh, necrosis. The intermediate part generally shows viable tumor and the periphery is tissue reaction, peripheral inflammation with fibrosis. So if you take a superficial biopsy, you will end up with inflammation and fibrosis as a diagnosis, resulting in misdiagnosis and mis uh, inappropriate management. So you have to go to the intermediate zone. That's the reason why we take superficial, middle and deep biopsy right to the epicenter of the tumor. And spindle to ovoid cells in loose mix mixoid stoma is the description with the mitos mitotic activity. Now, uh, immunohistochemistry is mandatory in any round cell tumor and rhabdomyosarcoma has a specific immunohistochemistry profile. In our series, we found uh, embryonal was the most common variant of rhabdomyosarcoma followed by alveolar. Pleomorphic is rare and botryoid is the rarest form. We should not forget the associations of rhabdomyosarcoma, life from any familial cancer syndrome associated with P53 mutation, neurofibromatosis type 1, Noonan syndrome, back with Wedemann syndrome and Costello syndrome are some of the known documented associations of rhabdomyosarcoma and uh, these are to be looked for. 
genetics is uh, coming into rhabdomyosarcoma research uh, very heavily, especially to identify chemo-resistant and refractory variants. The management of rhabdomyosarcoma is mainly guided by the intergroup rhabdomyosarcoma studies. This, this was a very successful major study which has uh, created several protocols for the management of rhabdomyosarcoma. It has resulted in uh, success of multimodal treatment. And when we uh, talk about management of rhabdomyosarcoma, it's generally uh, after risk stratification as low to intermediate and high. That is based on the uh, histopathology of the tumor and also the residual amount of tumor. If the tumor is completely removed, it goes to group one. If there is microscopic residual tumor with involvement of regional lymph nodes or both, then it goes to group two. And group, group three is gross residual tumor and group four is distant metastatic disease. But in the orbit, we have to be careful in an attempt to uh, completely remove the tumor, we should not uh, uh, make, you know, we should not have damage to the extraocular muscle or loss of vision. So surgery could be incisional biopsy alone in a situation where the tumor is in a crucial location, debulking or excision biopsy, followed by histopathological confirmation of the diagnosis. Then we start chemotherapy, which is a combination of VAC plus IE, three weekly alternating, and that is followed by radiation. So after three cycles of chemotherapy, we provide radiation and provide three more cycles of chemotherapy. This is the dosage uh, schedule that we follow. Vincristine, actinomycin D, and cyclophosphamide as one set of chemotherapeutic agents. Iphosphamide and etoposide as the another set of chemotherapeutic agents, alternating three weekly, three cycles, followed by external beam radiation. If there is no residual disease at all in the orbit, just before you do external beam radiation, the dose delivered is 4,500 to 5,000 centigrade. If there is residual disease, then it is 5,000 to 5,500 centigrade. And whenever, is radi whenever radiation is given, it is given to the entire pretreatment extent of the tumor, not to the debulk or uh, residual or to the post-chemotherapy residual. So treatment plan is based on the pretreatment extent of the tumor. And uh, in our series, we had a reasonably good outcome. Final visual outcome was... Uh, uh, as shown here, uh, majority of patients maintained reasonable vision. And uh, regression in our series with primary treatment alone was in 86%. Five, of course, recurred and they responded to secondary treatment, which was reinitiation of chemotherapy and in one patient, excentration and radiation. So uh, at the five, at the end of all of 97% had uh, uh, good outcome, they were alive, and one patient had uh, succumbed to metastasis. This is an example of a patient where the tumor was around the inferior rectus muscle. The muscle was not seen. There was restriction of ocular motility. So this is one example where we do uh, limited debulking or near total excision, leaving a part of the tumor behind. As you see here, this was if this was the inferior rectus, we left a part of the tumor along with it. That is the wedge that has been created, and rest of the tumor has been removed. So the residual tumor obviously has to be treated and that was treated with chemotherapy, stereotactic radiation and further chemotherapy. There's a patient where the tumor was around the superior rectus LPS complex. So it was nearly totally debulked followed by further treatment. And this child, you can see a good outcome with uh, uh, multimodal treatment. His cornea has actually become much clearer after exposure keratitis resolved. This was one more child with uh, multimodal treatment. This child was able to maintain his eye, but uh, had lost vision because of uh, prolonged disc edema and optic atrophy. This is a child who had to undergo orbital excentration. Even this, in this situation, we chemo reduced the tumor to the extent that we can do a safe orbital excentration uh, with uh, possibly with lid sparing so that we can uh, use an excentration prosthesis that can be very uh, easily mounted. One more patient with uh, resolution following multimodal treatment. So in all, we had 97% patient survival. This is uh, as compared to the uh, IRSG data and the SHIELDS uh, study earlier, we seem to have a slightly better survival. Uh, and although our follow-up is uh, lower, average follow-up is 3.3 years, their follow-up was much higher. In rhabdomyosarcoma, we realized that most of the metastasis occurs at a mean um, period of 36 months. So our follow-up is still good enough to say that the multimodal treatment has a better outcome than conventional treatment. 
So in conclusion, I would say that multimodal treatment, including initial surgery, which is guided by the extent of the tumor with an aim to preserve function of the eye as much as possible rather than complete removal of the tumor, followed by multi-drug chemotherapy, which is a combination of VAC and IE alternating and stereotactic radiotherapy provides excellent chance of local tumor control and life salvage in cases of advanced abdomasa. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Santosh. Uh, excellent presentation. And we are all grateful to you for the introduction of the concept of multimodal treatment protocols in India, especially in a country where we you know, land up with very advanced tumors, be it rhabdomyosarcoma, retinoblastoma, and for that matter, even in adults, for the lacrimal gland adenoid cystic carcinoma. And these are the lethal, uh, uh, you know, ocular malignancies. So thank you so much for your contribution. Yeah, I should see Paul here. Yeah. Hi, Paul. <laughs> ocular oncology in India and introduction of this uh, life salvage and life saving uh, treatment protocols. Thank you, sir. So, so we are going to take the questions at the end. Uh, will you be coming back after the back. session? I'll come back. I'll come. You'll come back? Okay. All right. Thank you. See you Thank you so much for making your time from the competitive session. I hope you do well there. See you, Paul. All right. Okay. So I'm going to take you through the next topic today. Um, I hope the slide is visible. Someone? Yes. Yes. Okay, okay ma'am. Thank you so much. Okay. So uh, I'll, I'll be talk, uh, taking you through retinoblastoma, the current approach in the management. And uh, uh, I have no financial disclosures or interest. Very grateful to all the patients, parents, and my dear mentors, including Dr. Santosh Unavar and uh, Shields and Shields, and my team of specialists who are involved in the management of these children. So uh, go, before going on to the current uh, uh, management, you know, uh, retinoblastoma has been uh, uh, introduced and known uh, way back in 15th century and honoring all the clinicians uh, and the researchers and these great personalities who have played a major role in retinoblastoma right from 18th century, uh, giving it a name, introducing mutation as a treatment, going on to plug brachytherapy. And it was Dr. Carl Kupfer who introduced systemic chemotherapy way back in 1950s. So now we are going to see what is happening in 2021. So the primary goal of retinoblastoma management has not changed in 2021. It still remains saving life followed by saving eyes and saving vision. So retinoblastoma in the clinical diagnosis, nothing has changed so far. It is a clinical, diagno it is a clinical diagnosis, retinoblastoma. Of course, uh, you know, additional diagnostic tools and ultrasound B scan still remains the main armamentarium in the diagnosis of retinoblastoma, although uh, fundus fluorescein angiography uh, is, uh, you know, OCT has been introduced in the diagnosis in various uh, situations as well. So uh, just touching upon the classification, and we have Dr. Paul uh, Paltifinger here. He's going to take us through the AJCC uh, classification. So what I just want to highlight here is what are we using currently? We are using the International Classification of Retinoblastoma, which has been introduced uh, in 2003. And currently we have switched to the, not really switched, we have combined both the classification in most of our clinical practice. So just taking you through the uh, international classification of intraocular retinoblastoma, uh, you know, uh, there has been certain shortcomings in this. And uh, what I will be doing here is rather than taking out the differences, I'm going to show how easily you can correlate these things and document and use in your clinical practice. So group A are those tumors which are less than three millimeters in Size. We all know that group B are those with more than three millimeters in size and subretinal fluid is included in group B as well. Now I'm just going to switch over to the TNM classification here. We have the clinical TNM classification and the pathological TNM classification. So when you want to document as a clinician and an ocular oncologist in your practice, so the CT1 it talks about the size. So both group A and group B is uh, 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 falls under the uh, CT1, where less than three is the A and more than three is the B, whereas the subretinal fluid is not included over there. Then we come to the group C, where the confined seeds, tumors with confined seeds, which is very focal, close to the tumor, comes under group C, and those which is away from the tumor and diffuse comes under the group D. Switching over to the CTNMH classification, 
complications. So when the fluid and seeds uh, come to play and you find it in the uh, clinical evaluation, then it is CT2. So it will be 2A if there is fluid and if there is seeds, be it vitreous seeds or subretinal seeds, it will be 2B. So in the T, T1 classification, it's a size. And in T2, you have two parameters, which is the fluid and the seeds. Now, group E are those extensive tumors, intraocular tumors, all these features. Uh, Dr. Uh, Anirban has also highlighted neovascular glaucoma, intraocular hemorrhage, aseptic orbital cellulitis, uh, prethysis and thysis bulbi, which falls under E, which is extensive. Now, when we talk about TNMH, the CT3 actually, uh, group E involves in the CT3. And in fact, in T3, you have A to E. Uh, depending upon the clinical features, including thysis, anterior segment invasion, intraocular pressure, neovascular glaucoma, uh, bophthalmos, high femur, massive interest hem uh, vitreous hemorrhage, and aseptic orbital cellulitis, which is at the end of the spectrum, the E spectrum. And CT4 is also included, the extraocular tumor, which is not there in the uh, international uh, classification of retinoblastoma, which is either you diagnose it radiologically, and if it is clinically very much evident, then it is 4B. So this is how you know I correlate it for an easy remembering of these uh, uh, classification to include in our documentation. So AJCC TNM classification was introduced in 2017, and what is most important in retinoblastoma currently, uh, you know, uh, what we see in the AJCC TNM uh, classification is the addition of the hereditary component, which is not in, included in any other cancers or tumors uh, in the body. So again, we have the clinical TNM classification and the pathological TNM classification. So Dr. Uh, Paul T. Finger is going to take us through the entire work on this in the next keynote lecture. Next is a classification of vitreous seeds. And this has been a recent uh, introduction after we you know, gone through the evolution of treating the vitreous seeds. And this is basically a morphological classification where, you know, if you find spherules, uh, seeds, uh, it uh, comes under spherules, the dusting of the vitreous seeds, and then the cloud. So this is basically a morphological classification which was put forward by Munir et al. Now, going on to the current treatment uh, protocols in retinoblastoma. Retinoblastoma, we all know, is a curable eye cancer and the primary management uh, eye salving, uh, you know, uh, uh, eye saving uh, primary management would be systemic chemotherapy and intraarterial chemotherapy, apart from enucleation in advanced intraocular retinoblastoma. So each of it has uh, pros and cons, and uh, this basically touching upon a country like India. Systemic chemotherapy is something which is very financially feasible for our patients who come from the financially, uh, you know, a backward uh, society. And the most important thing when you compare uh, intraarterial chemotherapy with systemic chemotherapy is that it achieves all three goals, especially in a country like, you know, a uh, 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 less developing country where we see more advanced cases where there is high risk of systemic micrometastasis. Intraarterial chemotherapy, we do have sent in India, it is effective, but currently it's quite expensive for the patients to afford. Edgewin modalities, yes, we use still use cryotherapy, laser therapy, transpupillary thermotherapy, periocular chemotherapy, and the recent introduction of intraocular chemotherapy, intravitreal and intracameral uh, cameral, uh, chemotherapy has helped us in salvaging many eyes. And of course, plug brachytherapy, which is a very localized uh, radiotherapy for retinoblastoma. Systemic intravenous chemotherapy, there has not been change in any protocols. It has been the time-tested protocols of vincristine, etoposide, and carboplatin. And well, we have seen very good uh, uh, outcome with uh, systemic intravenous chemotherapy with retinoblastoma. As you can see here, a group A, B, and C eyes, which is completely regressed with uh, a systemic intravenous chemotherapy with good salvage, eye salvage rate. But then the difficult situation comes is the group D eyes and the group E eyes. Group D eyes, uh, well, from the literature, it is around 50 to 70% salvage with systemic chemotherapy and additional other treatment. Well, group E eyes mostly go for enucleation. Now, this is where intra-arterial chemotherapy uh, you know, plays a role major. Uh, uh, in salvaging these groups, group D eyes. So the uh, eye salvage in uh, with intraarterial chemotherapy in group D eyes has been extremely beneficial 
And one of the other thing is that it takes care of only eye salvage because it's a very targeted therapy and systemic uh, life salvage is uh, uh, is not part of intraarterial chemotherapy. So it's basically a direct uh, introduction of chemotherapeutic agents into the ophthalmic artery. And the drugs are totally different from what we use for systemic chemotherapy. It's melphalan, topotecan, and carboplatin, be it a single drug, a double drug, or a triple drug. So these are a few of the results with intraarterial chemotherapy. This is after four sessions in a group EI, and this is a group DI where, you know, which is in the periphery and it has been treated completely resolved. So peripheral tumors, uh, you know, these are uh, where even vision salvage was possible with intra-arterial uh, chemotherapy after three sessions for a peripheral tumor. And as you can see here, uh, correlated with the OCT where phobia is absolutely healthy. And uh, is it safe? Yes, it is safe. And this was the youngest patient that I have in my series, four weeks of age with uh, bilateral retinoblastoma and unilateral naturally treated one eye uh, with uh, intraarterial chemotherapy and the other eye was treated with transpupillary thermotherapy focally. So this is what the uh, comparison is between chemo reduction and systemic chemotherapy and intraarterial chemotherapy. What you see is the major jump of eye salvage from 47% from 85% to 94% in intraarterial chemotherapy. And this is a, a, a review where group EIs are not, uh, intraarterial chemotherapy is not too beneficial in group EIs. Whatever the uh, uh, you know advancement is, whatever the advance in the techniques are, we should also recognize and realize there are downfalls to it. We should recognize the vision threatening complications associated with it, so that you know uh, the uh, case selection is based on that. So more than the indication, we should be able to know what you should not be uh, doing with intraarterial chemotherapy. The contraindication has to be outlined very very well uh, in advanced intraocular RBs with clinical high risk features. It should not be used bilateral uh, IAC, if vision salvage is uh, a factor, then it should be avoided as well. Now, uh, management of vitreous seeds with intravitreal chemotherapy is something which is a boon, although we had hesitated to go inside an eye with tumor earlier. So this is a child, uh, one eye enucleated, only one eye where he had a recurrence and the only treatment given was intravitreal topotecan. Now, the use of intravitreal topotecan has been uh, broadened in, in my practice, and I'm sure in most of your practice, this is an endophytic tumor which was treated with intravitreal topotecan. In, in our uh, series, we had a recurrence in one patient uh, and uh, well, uh, the regression has been 100%. And this recurrence was due to the tumor recurrence that the patient had. Uh, last, uh, intracameral injection. Again, topotecan is my favorite in an intracameral injection where we go uh, clear corneal. And this is a child who had bilateral anterior segment RB. And this is one eye. And the other eye has already gone for thysis after treatment. So we had to save the right eye. Uh, with the ciliary body involvement, in fact, his retina was absolutely fine, and he received intracameral chemotherapy and intravitreal chemotherapy to salvage that one eye. Enucleation, yes, we should also know that high-risk features in enucleation is very, very important for life salvage. I'm just touching upon the life salvage in retinoblastoma, which Dr. Santosh is not. So post-enucleation adjuvant chemotherapy is very, very important in order to save the life of these children. Orbital retinoblastoma, again, the introduction of intensive multimodal treatment protocol, including high-dose chemotherapy, enucleation, and radiotherapy has actually helped us salvage the life in most of these children, where compared to other uh, treatment modalities, it has been 90% in our uh, study. So a uh, take home message from this particular uh, 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 talk would be that uh, retinoblastoma management, uh, uh, the primary goal is always life salvage. And in fact, the newer modalities has helped us to salvage more eyes and also improvement of vision. Thank you very much for your patient listening. So now we go on to uh, the keynote lecture of the day. And after that, we will be taking discussions. I'm going to share the screen. Farooz? Yes, Dr. Uh, Good, uh, Good Dr. evening, I believe in India. It's morning here in New York. Uh, we'll soon be watching a short movie on AJCC RB staging. A little background I think will be helpful. 
In 2003, I was selected to chair the seventh edition joint of the American Joint Committee on Cancer's AJCC effort for ophthalmic oncology. I knew the sixth edition was not being used. So I created the AJCC UICC Ophthalmic Oncology Task Force based on the principle of what is made by the community will be used by the community. Therefore, I assembled a community of experts from medical oncology, pediatric oncology, oculoplastic surgery, radiation oncology, and included members of the UICC. Carefully organized into tumor specific task groups, each eye cancer staging system was created by eye cancer specialists published in and thus known for that specific tumor type. In 2009, the seventh edition AJCC criteria became the first internationally accepted consensus guidelines for staging eye cancers. This process was repeated for the eighth edition in two, between 2012 and 2016, such that 58 specialists from 13 countries participated in critical evidence-based reviews and updates. One can see today that the AJCC has been accepted by the UICC, the world version, and physicians, researchers, pathologists, and patients around the world. It has been integrated into the instructions for authors of the most prestigious ophthalmological journals, searching PubMeds for the words AJCC and I, one sees an exponential rise in the AJCC's acceptance for research and publication. First for the seventh edition and then another increase after the eighth edition publication. In addition, and this is very important, the American College, uh, the College of American Pathologists has incorporated AJCC into PTNM, the pathologic staging, uh, into their reporting forms. These CAP consensus ophthalmic pathology reporting forms are freely downloadable on the, the, the CAP website. And I invite you to download them and share them with your pathologist so that the more of the world, if they're not doing it already, can report on retinoblastoma and uveal melanoma in a standard fashion so that we can start adding and looking at things together. Adoption of a common ophthalmic oncology la language has, has allowed additive analysis and comparison of large numbers of eye cancers. Since 2008, several multi-center international ophthalmic registries have occurred and have published. I can't go through them all within the time allowed, but let's talk about retinoblastoma. As Farouz has shown today, ABCT may be easier but it does not provide the depth of information needed to differentiate retinoblastomas, nor extraocular disease, nor staging of systemic disease. The AJCC Retinoblastoma Registry has collected 2,190 patients from 18 eye centers in six continents. Thus far, the pooled data now analyzed has revealed that the, the staging system is validated. It includes the H for heritable trait and is the only used to predict metastasis associated mortality. Treatment success and globe salvage. Most recently, this data revealed that worse outcomes for patients in lower income groups and those with diffuse retinoblastoma seeds. So please take a, a, a short look at this video uh, on AJCC OOTF retinoblastoma registry publications of my recently graduated fellow, Dr. Ankit Tamar. Thank you very much, Dr. Finger. I'm going to share this slide over here. So Dr. Palti Finger doesn't need an introduction. He's already there on the dais and he has already spoken a lot about uh, the uh, work that he has been doing on ocular oncology. He is uh, an ophthalmologist uh, from New York and he is uh, the clinical professor of ophthalmology at the New York University School of Medicine in New York City. And he has been a great mentor uh, to all the students worldwide. And we have so many of them in India who has done their fellowship from uh, Dr. Finger and in turn contributed a lot uh, to Indian literature in ocular oncology as far as uh, papers, publications, and they have done extremely well uh, 
as far as academics is also concerned. And they are very good clinicians in uh, ocular oncology in India at this point of time. So he has contributed a lot to Indian ocular oncology as well. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Finger. Thanks a lot. And Thank we're you, proud Dr. of all your fellows. All Thank right. you for a wonderful introduction. I appreciate it. Yeah. So now we go on to the video I'm going to play here, uh, which Dr. Finger uh, has submitted. Hello everyone. My name is Dr. Ankit Singh Tomar and I'm a clinical fellow with Dr. Paul T. Finger. I'll be presenting our research about the American Joint Committee for Cancer Staging for Retinoblastoma. This registry-based study was conducted in 18 centers from 13 countries and six continents and all authors were a part of AJCC Ophthalmic Oncology Task Force. The authors have no conflict of interest and the registry received funding from these foundations who had no role in the design or conduct of this research. Herein, we assess the potential of the eighth edition of AJCC cancer staging system for retinoblastoma to predict metastasis-related mortality and local treatment failure based on tumor category. We also compared the AJCC RB staging to prior existing classifications, namely the Children's Hospital Los Angeles and Wells Eye Hospital classification. But before we proceed, let's discuss why do we need the AJCC RB classification? The fact is, none of the existing classifications predict both globe and life salvage. The use of multiple staging systems confuses clinical, research based, and cross specialty communication. In contrast, the AJCC staging system works on a standard, world-accepted TNM framework. It is the only system to incorporate heritable trait as well as both intraocular and extraocular retinoblastoma. Since it is already adopted by the AJCC's worldwide counterpart, the UICC, this system has been accepted by medical oncology, radiation oncology, pathology, medical journals, and societies across the world. About our study, we created a multi-center international internet-based retrospective registry to evaluate the AJCC staging system for RB. All centers obtained an institutional review board and ethics approval to share de-identified data that conform to the tenets of Declaration of Helsinki and HIPAA. Each center utilized its own diagnostic and therapeutic methods. Clinical, demographic, and treatment data were noted. Local treatment failure was defined as need for secondary enucleation or EBRT after an attempt at eye salvage, whereas RB metastasis related deaths were analyzed in the survival outcomes. Patient survival and globe salvage were analyzed using the 8th edition AJCC clinical tumor categories for statistical significance. This multi center RB study collected world data from 2,190 patients who received treatment between 2001 and 2013. Let's first look at the life salvage analysis. The median follow-up period was four years. And over this follow-up period, 5% patients developed metastatic disease. From the graph, we can see that the smaller tumor categories, that is CT1 and CT2, have excellent life prognosis. Whereas CT3, the yellow curve, and CT4, the red curve, are significantly divergent. The cumulative survival for the most advanced category, that is CT4, was 45% at five years. Cox proportional regression hazard analysis showed that CT3 had an eight-fold risk, whereas CT4 had a 48-fold risk of metastatic mortality when compared to CT1A. It is important to note that both CHLA and WH classifications were never intended to predict metastatic mortality. However, in that they have been used for such, we performed a similar statistical analysis for comparison. These graphs highlight two important facts. Number one, AJCC RB classification had a better tumor stratification for risk of metastasis related mortality than CHLA and WEH. And number two, note the group E lines, that is the red curve on both the graphs. Due to difference in the staging criteria for CHLA versus WH, there was a significant difference in the number of patients in group E. CHLA had 797, whereas WH had almost double, that is 1473. And this resulted in a skew in resultant prognosis. A similar analysis was conducted for all enucleated eyes. 
we found that high risk pathological features have a higher risk of metastatic mortality with extra scleral spread that is pt4 having 77 fold risk when compared to intraocular disease that is pt1 of the 1574 eyes with attempted globe salvage 27% needed ebrt or secondary enucleation with increasing ct category there was a proportionate increase in the risk of local treatment failure ct3 which includes clinical high risk features such as aseptic cellulitis hyphema vitreous hemorrhage neovascular glaucoma etc had a 45 fold risk of local treatment failure compared to ct1a while comparing these three classification systems ajcc and chla have comparable globe salvage curves with significantly diverging lines especially in the advanced rb cases that is group c d and e in chl wh on the other hand has a relatively unbalanced curves due to identical prognosis of group c and d that is the yellow and the purple curves for two year mark and then very few patients beyond that. our results highlight the importance of international multi center cooperative data sharing for rare cancers the result of the study validates the prognostic ability of ajcc rb classification for metastatic mortality and local treatment failure to summarize ajcc rb eighth edition staging should be adopted as a universal rb classification to enable uniform clinical research and cross specialty communication it addresses intraocular and extraocular retinoblastoma histopathological features in enucleated eyes nodal and systemic status and predicts metastatic mortality and globe salvage the links to our research papers are shown on the screen the first paper is about the risk of metastatic related mortality and life salvage the second one is for local treatment failure and globe salvage whereas our third manuscript talks about treatment outcomes by national income across the globe in conclusion the eighth edition ajcc rb staging is derived from evidence based data and international consensus we believe that the universal adoption of this system will clarify outcome reporting and improve research and patient care if you found this video helpful for your understanding or clinical practice or if you support such multi center international cooperative research or if you just want to help please consider visiting the i cancer foundation website and making a donation to support this initiative thank you excellent uh, dr finger and thank you very very much for being part of this and i would uh, request yeah and ankit did a good job as well under your guidance so may i request all the other speakers to put on your video and uh, we have dr polty finger right here and we can shoot any questions to him do we have any questions from the audience dr seema hey hi paris yeah uh, very good morning dr uh, paul finger and thank you very much for coming up with this uh, you know study on the tnm classifications system it's very much needed and ankit uh, uh, did a fantastic job uh, so uh, just had one query wanted to understand from you uh, like in the tnm um, unlike the uh, previous grouping systems uh, uh, the t uh, 2b includes um, all the vitreous and the uh, subretinal seeds so it is not subdivided into either focal or whether it's a diffuse involvement so and we know that the prognosis is somewhat different um, whether if there is a focal seeds vis-a-vis -vis if there is a diffuse seeds so do you think it is going to make a difference uh, when we sort of you know analyze our data based on the tnm are we sort of uh, clubbing the two different maybe a little uh, spectrum of disease together um that's an excellent you know you know that's an excellent point in fact uh, we have a publication that's sort of been hung up in uh, in peer review for probably about 8 or 9 months uh getting going through revisions uh, addressing in part what you're saying uh but it brings up another point and that is that the wonderful thing about the ajcc is it's not static every uh periodically it is updated and as evidence it has to be statistically significant evidence but as evidence arises we can change it as a group 
and that is another difference between uh, the existing uh, uh, other um, staging systems. And also um, the second um, um, category that is the uh, P3, uh, which is uh, subdivided basically according to either there is a radiological evidence or there is a clinical evidence. Uh, now, a uh, few years back, we were trying to analyze our data on extraocular RV because we see a lot of extraocular RV in our part of the India. In fact, in India itself, the North India probably sees um, the disease spectrum as little more sort of, you know, advanced in terms of a lot of patients comes with, comes with extraocular disease, unlike maybe South India, which sees a slightly better uh, sort of you know, spectrum profile in terms of the patient profile. So what we found was uh, when we tried to see the survival according to the international staging system, uh, we found that the stage two, which includes all microscopic residual tumor, uh, now, we see a lot of patients where enucleation has been done, uh, maybe not at a tertiary care practice, but sometimes even at a secondary care practice, where maybe an adequate uh, optic nerve stump has not been taken. And many a times, even the imaging findings are not sort of seen very carefully. And those patients land up with having a residual optic nerve or, or the cut end of, of the optic nerve positive. Now, those technically falls into the, T, uh, the stage two as per the international staging system. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis the stage three where there is an overt orbital disease. So surprisingly, we found that in stage two, many a times where most of the patients were in that category who had uh, like uh, came with the recurrence, the survival was actually poorer than the stage three disease. Now in the TNM, again, um, if, if just based on radiological evidence, we uh, find that uh, there is an optic nerve involvement where may not, uh, there might not be very evident clinical proptosis. Uh, those patients uh, might have a poorer prognosis vis-a-vis um, -vis those patients who have an overt orbital, especially anterior orbital involvement. So do you think this is going to confound the results when we uh, sort of uh, categorize them according to the, um, into the T3 as per the TNM? So uh, that's an excellent, excellent point. <laughs> so one of the things that we have with retrospective registries is a uh, limited number of data fields. We have a lot of data fields for the retinoblastoma registry, but a lot of these questions that arise need to be answered. And we can go back to, the, those, uh, to that data, but it speaks even, even, even uh, underscores the need for data collection and to answer these questions to improve the AJCC and, the UIC, and thus the UICC uh, staging system so that we can better prognosticate uh, outcomes for patients. Uh, we will heavily depend on, on centers from uh, India and China and Southeast Asia to provide the data uh, for these patients because in the US, these uh, are actually quite rare events. And uh, part of the, uh, our, I think part of our mission as physicians will be to uh, educate the patients, so hopefully the children won't uh, even get there. But thank you, Siva. I'd like to keep you involved. You know, I think you should be involved with uh, Ashwin Malapatna now is reviewing some data for some clinical questions and contact us and we'll take a look at the data that's available to see if we can differentiate. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Fika. Thank you very much, Seema. That is a very important question. You know, there is definitely a contradiction in uh, the staging system and the TNM staging system. So uh, we can take some questions. Uh, so Dr. Usha uh, Kim is here and she has presented uh, the genetic, uh, you know, uh, re results from South India. And ma'am, uh, uh, what is the uh, uh, kind of cohort that you uh, see in uh, Arvindai Hospital? It's only the South Indian patients or you do get patients from other part of uh, India as well? Yeah, I, I think it's majority of it is from Southern part of India, but we do occasionally get patients from other centers, especially who've trained out of Arvind and then they go down there. And uh, I think vast majority would be South. So we get patients from Kerala, from Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, and uh, mostly from Tamil Nadu. Okay. And being the tertiary center for the southern part, 
you know, down south, I think uh, we get mostly from districts below uh, Madurai. Ma'am, uh, uh, regarding the genetic study again, have you uh, uh, got the opportunity to look into chemo-resistant uh, patients, and have you found anything? Yeah, that's what I was mentioning. I was mentioning. I think we had a paper just published a few days back. Okay. So there is a difference in the pattern of uh, the spectrum is different from the uh, the resilient ones show a different spectrum. So we've found that. So we are trying to use that as a predictive factor for uh, not engaging in extensive chemotherapy because right now we keep giving the uh, chemo. And one unfortunate uh, problem that we are facing with this, the compliance part. You know, some of them, uh, after six cycles, they don't show up. One, financial constraints. That apart, the, uh, you know, the lack of interest falls as uh, you keep insisting them to follow up every, you know, like every, almost every month. So that part, we've seen a lot of patients who've been resistant and resilient to the treatment, uh, even after a significant number of cycles. Those are patients we've taken up and we have uh, isolated. Though the numbers are very few, we have seen a difference in the pattern of uh, mutation. The spectrum is different, yeah. Okay. This has been the resistant and recurrent cases that yes. you're talking about. No, the resistant ones I've specifically identified. Mm -hmm. The recurrent ones are probably either because of, uh, you know, non-compliance for a period of time and then they come back with the, you know, um, significant growth. And uh, the follow-up has not been very stringent. Fortunately, for most patients, the follow-up has been kept quite uh, stringent. But then some of the cases don't show up because of the, uh, you know, increased number of cycles. Okay. Ma'am, and these are, I understand most of them are blood samples. Uh, do you do fresh tissue as well? Yeah. So in our, uh, you know, in uh, the cases where we are treating the patients, which was what I showed as the four, the five cases, the samples we have taken, we've had the tumor sample, we've had the blood samples of not only the probiotics, siblings, as well as the uh, parents. Those were the uh, samples that we received. Um, have you studied on vitreous samples and aqueous samples also? Uh, no, we have not done a, a liquid biopsy, something uh, we have not uh, yet ventured into. Mm -hmm. Probably we will do that. Uh, yeah, and I think there's a little thought on uh, CSF also. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Any other questions from the panelists? Um, I'll be getting uh, in touch with you soon about uh, genetic analysis for a patient from Chennai also. Yeah, because uh, welcome, welcome, yeah. <laughs> I, I would suggest everyone else also because the cost of genetic analysis at Aravind is substantially lower than what is available in most of the private laboratories. Number one, it's very difficult to get the genetic analysis done. Only one or two places are doing it. Availability is not much. So I think uh, we should all make use of the specialty which is there. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, I think uh, we've also been uh, making sure that those who cannot afford right now for the treatment chemo also, we're providing it completely free of cost for those who cannot afford, including the genetic analysis. So, I mean, you, we'll have to understand that it's not possible for everybody, but at least for those who cannot completely afford, uh, we are, it's called the ring of hope. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. The project is... Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Dr. So thanks, Dr. Finger. I think that was excellent. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, speaking amidst, uh, in your presence, actually. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, I, I really, uh, yeah. I, I thank Farooz for inviting me to, uh, to join you all. It's wonderful to see you and see that you're all healthy, most importantly. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So I have few questions to other speakers just to make it quite interactive. Uh, so first question is to Dr. Vikas Mehman uh, regarding the congenital pediatric congenital tumors. Uh, congenital tumors is something. Oh, uh, voice is breaking, uh, Pyrus. Uh, let me just switch off my video. Maybe my I am having some issues. Uh, uh, yeah. Is it my voice? Yeah, I'm. Uh, yeah, please continue. Yeah, regarding the congenital tumors in pediatric age group, and congenital nevus is something which is very, very common. 
and we land up in a situation where the parents are worried about you know a sudden growth of a conjunctival nevus and we all know that it's a benign uh, 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 neoplasia so what is uh, how do you uh, take care of this and you know when do you go for an excision of a conjunctival nevus uh, in a child see normally i just uh, counsel the parents adequately that uh, and try to show them with the help of uh, try to show them how they can take good quality photographs of the nevus at home so that they can observe periodically uh, over a period of time if there is any change in the color or the size of the nevus i actually tell them that they can use their mobile camera cameras i just show them in opd when they come and they are worried that how to do it and i tell them to take a photograph once every month or so if you are too concerned Uh, in some uh, of the older children where parents are very much concerned about cosmesis uh, then yes i do remove some of them for cosmesis if the parents are really persisting but for most part i think it's about our counseling the way we counsel the parents and we alleviate their apprehension if we can are able to do that then they most of them do understand that nothing needs to be done for most of them and sometimes we see inflamed nevi where there is a change in the color or the size suddenly and so in those cases uh, again you know you can give a shot of topical steroids which can help to reduce the redness or the angriness that sometimes appears in these lesions ma'am you want to add something no I, it's not about this particular scenario yes i think it's a very difficult uh, situation especially when it's growing uh, patients get too i mean the parents get too anxious i do agree with vikas about uh, counseling is the most important thing but it's very difficult mm-hmm. and uh, in some of the scenarios the other question i wanted to ask vikas is also about the lymphoid hyperplasia how often have you noticed lymph- the rest of the panelists too because we do see a lot of these lymphoid hyperplasias in the recent past is that the same with your everybody oh uh, not very often ma'am not very often especially in kids in adults yes uh, i would say when i was in delhi maybe around two or three cases in a year not too much not too many and in kids again it would be like even less than adults probably maybe once a year or something like that so not very common but are you seeing them more often now yes 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 the for the i have seen about three in a year now i mean that is something unusual three in a year and uh, the pediatric or adult pediatric this was yes. all this. so in uh, all the three cases what we had done was excised and they all seemed to recur with the same vigor you know and uh, uh, what's happening is now the question is how how many how many times can you do it you know one now what's the other option we have two and are these the ones which are going to get converted eventually these are the three questions that i've been thinking about so because in the adults we keep a track of these patients but these are young kids they school going children i mean in fact all three of them are less than about i think the oldest was 12 yeah. but the one common thing i found was all three were obese i mean this is all three were obese obese okay. yeah that's the only common factor in these three kids i have not seen uh, in pediatric age group but just a thought i was thinking if it's recurring again and again to consider an ultra low dose uh, radiotherapy in this ultra low dose radiotherapy the boom boom radiotherapy are to but yeah, yeah. these are kids then you know you would be little very what about maybe <laughs> just thinking like you know maybe a injection of rituximab subconjunctively yeah maybe so, we can try that for recurrences <laughs> i've seen about i've seen two cases in the last one year pediatric cases but they've been spaced apart i mean no clustering as such i would say just two cases in the last year see i know yeah maybe we have any uh, anybody other thoughts i mean like dr finger are you there yes i'm sorry i'm having trouble hearing you Okay. Would you rephrase the question? So, ma'am, do you want to go ahead here? Yeah. No, no. What I was mentioning was that we've had a couple of cases with lymphoid hyperplasia especially in the pediatric age group. And yes. 
on accession never recurred. So I've, I've found in in New York uh, a lot of uh, just curiously a, a bunch of young men with bilateral lymphoid hyperplasia on the nasal epivulvar surface, and I find that they're doing this at home. All right. So I told mom to keep their hands behind their backs a little bit because I think that touching actually it can in children especially they can their hands may be transporting material into their on their conjunctiva and causing a secondary reaction, at least here in New York. Um, don't see too much primary lymphoid, diffuse lymphoid hyperplasia that would simulate a lymphoma in children, uh, except, you know, if they, unless in the setting of uh, systemic disease. Well, uh, yeah, I'll keep that in mind, but it's just, yeah. Watch their hands, you know, I think that a lot of times they, they have exuberant uh, uh, immune systems. And so if, they, if they're touching their eyes uh, a lot, they could be creating the lymphoid hyperplasia. That's a, that's a useful tip, yeah. So we'll keep that in mind. Probably we'll investigate that matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Dr. Anirban, do you have any questions? Any discussion from your side? You're muted, Dr. Anirban. I'm sorry? Doctor. There was, uh, there was, there was, yes, Dr. Anirban. Audible. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, one of the concerns uh, that we had about the HACC, Seema has already asked Dr. Finger, and he has answered that for us. And yes, uh, a revision would probably change the setting for cut end of the optic nerve versus orbital invasion. Uh, what I wanted to ask again is, how do you, uh, your results with topotecan, intrabitreal topotecan, for every patient who's received topotecan alone, over the last three years that we've been using it, we've had a recurrence. And we've had to add melphalan subsequently. I, I don't understand why we should have a difference in results. Can I take that question, uh, Dr. Anirban? Yes, Feroz, it's actually directed to you. Okay, yeah. So I hardly use melphalan, uh, Dr. Anirban. All the cases are topotic and I use melphalan. I have used melphalan only in very few cases where it's mm. like recurrent after topotican and that are very, very few. So I have got excellent results with topotican in India as well as in China, the series. So... Uh, I don't know whether it is. Uh, Could you try again? I don't know whether it is the product that is available. Uh, what is the experience uh, with Seema and Dr. Vikas Menon? I have got excellent results, and the dosage that I use is thirty microgram per zero point one mL. Okay. I guess is it reasonable to to expect that all tumors will respond to one? type of therapy. I, I don't think so. There are not too many diseases that are always respond to the same type of therapy. So I think there probably must be some topotecan resistant cases. Dr. Seema, what is your experience? Arose, again, uh, I would say whatever, uh, not too many injections, but whatever I had, uh, so it's not only single topotecan uh, which has uh, worked. In some patients, yes, only topotecan, but we had a substantial uh, proportion, I would say at least about 30 to 40, somewhere between, where uh, a double injection was required. Uh, two drugs, either two drugs or they're all shifting to melphalan. Melphalan. Yeah. Dr. Usha, about your experience? We've had a mixed experience. Mm -hmm. We've had some resistance and some cases where which did well. But we we are using both melphalan and topotecan here. Now you're using them both together or you're using them individually? Individually. Okay. Yeah. I so said what mixed, you... mixed experience, but we're doing it mm -hmm. individually. Yeah. What about so Vikas? We... Vikas? 
Dr. Vikas, is he frozen? No. Ma'am, uh, uh, my experience with the intravitreal topotecan would be less than what Dr. Anirban and Dr. Seema or maybe uh, or you or Dr. Fairuz have done. I've done few cases, but what I've seen is uh, uh, I had I remember one case uh, who uh, who had come from Africa, the child and. Uh, one eye had to be nucleated for a bad group E tumor and the other eye we were trying to say which had vitreous seeds. So in that patient, uh, we tried uh, Topotecan first, but uh, the response was not that great and that was the only seeing eye. So in that patient, we had to use both. Leaving apart that case, uh, uh, then I've had few more cases where only Topotecan has worked. Multiple injections have been given, three case, three injections uh, uh, or four injections have been required, but uh, there are other cases where only Topotecan has also worked for the vitreous seed. So I would say it's it's probably, you know, in, in, my, in my whatever limited small experience in comparison to all of you, I've got a very limited experience, I must say that, but uh, you all have more with the vitreous seeds, but then whatever I've seen is uh, Topotecan also has worked. Well, only as a solo therapy in few cases. And yeah, in one odd case, I remember where we had to use melphalan. And, and the looking at the RP reaction, in that particular patient, there was such a pigmentary reaction, an African child with melphalan, such a florid pigmentary reaction that it was a little scary. Those uh, bony spicule type of picture had appeared all over the retina. And that uh, was a little scary. And that too, in, in only seeing eye. We did not do ERG for that patient, but uh, clinically, the vitreous seeds responded very well. So the child is still under follow-up and is still able to see everything is doing well. And he ha hasn't had any recurrence so far. But yes, on the other hand, Topotecan also alone has worked in few patients. No, I won't say that, you know, it hasn't worked. It, it has worked for me. Another question, Fairuz, I have another question. Yes, many, have you had the experience of doing a vitrectomy with melphalan infusion and uh, what's your do you have case series on that anybody else too I see my anybody because no ma'am i don't have in india but i have uh, have colleagues in china who does a lot of uh, vitrectomy and in fact they also do tuberectomy with uh, melphalan infusion over there. So one case I, I I I do remember I have had one case in 2004 to be very precise, where uh, the patient had bilateral uh, tumor. One eye was enucleated, the other eye had vitreous seeds. So we had to do a, a vitrectomy with melphalan infusion, and in fact, because Dr. Kim who did the surgery, and the child is still surviving. And that was a child who I mentioned even in the genetic testing. He's from all these. And he wanted to know about the secondary tumor. So he came back to us 18 years later to find out whether. So he's, as far as I know, I mean, my limited experience in this area, I think uh, I, I would like to know how many other people have had such a similar experience. I'm here, I don't personally have any experience. Neither in China, I have personal experience, but I have colleagues. I know them very well who does it. And yeah, yeah. Dr. Seema? No, no, Dr. Usha, no. I, I don't have any experience. don't have any patients where you have done the procedure. I mean, of course, the, with the retina. We had one child, though, where, like, you know, we were planning, because this was the only eye, uh, developed an RD uh, over the course of the treatment that was post-ISC. She developed an RD, RAG RD, and we were planning a um, surgery, but uh, uh, somehow the family did not give the consent, and they got lost to follow up. So beyond that, we did not plan any for any patient. Right. Yeah. So, Dr. Seema, I'll uh, have this question to you. Dr. Santosh is not here regarding uh, rhabdomyosarcoma in children. So I'm sure, depending upon the pathological uh, pathological uh, subtypes, you know, prognosis is depend total totally upon that. So what is your experience on that using multimodal treatment protocol and life salvage, depending, categorizing the pathological subtypes in rhabdomyosarcoma? Uh, so Ferus, most of the uh, patients that I have seen of RMS is during the fellowship time, that's from LVP. So I think it's the same data, uh, what uh, Dr. Santosh has, so it will be similar experience. 
here in Delhi, uh, uh, it's not too many of RMS that we see here. I don't know why. So the numbers will be in single digit what I've seen in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and it follows the same uh, prognosis as Dr. Santosh has mentioned. The embryonal remains the most common subtype. Mm -hmm. And I think there was one patient who was alveolar subtype. Uh, and that was a young adult patient. Mm -hmm. uh, surprisingly, this patient had a very well-defined tumor. In fact, it, it just came out like, an, like you take out a pleomorphic adenoma. It was in the lateral quadrant. Our clinical working diagnosis was a pleomorphic adenoma because it was very well defined on imaging. Uh, it just came out very easily, uh, looked encapsulated, completely resected. That's what we thought. But uh, the histopath showed a pleomorphic variant, uh, the alveolar variant. Mm -hmm. So uh, we uh, planned for post op adjuvant uh, radiation. He did not turn up for that. He came back, I think, six years down the line with a massive recurrence mm -hmm. in the orbit. Yeah. So that was one patient where uh, we had a subtype which was other than embryonal, and he did not do very well. Okay, yeah, something the biggest challenging situation for ocular oncologists in India is the follow up, where you know we just lose these patients mostly to follow up. So yeah, I think a lot of shopping because once the minute you say that you have to undergo enucleation, they shift over. Or if you start talking about some venture that is going to take them multiple visits, visits or cost them a little more, they shift to another center. That's that's quite common here also. And what happens is eventually uh, for our rhabdomyosarcomas, we've had people coming in very late stages. Mm -hmm. Invariably, you'll have to do something very aggressive, despite the fact that we know we can, uh, we could have done something better. So that's another problem. And unfortunately or fortunately, I mean, it's good in one sense that we have so many oncolo ocular oncologists at this point of time. But at the same time, people don't understand that the treatment is not going to vary too much. It's going to be the same amongst all the people. But uh, the compliance part, as you say, it's two different types of issues. One is economic constraints. The other is uh, repeated visits. And the third problem is moving from one center to another. I think if you look at all our registries also, we've, I think we've had some common uh, registries where uh, all our centers were involved. And we, we would see that invariably, unless we identify and tell them, okay, it's okay to go anywhere else, but please ensure that you complete the follow-up. And there are times when we have to let go of these patients for proximity reasons. Like for example, if it was like somewhere in, in, uh, in a center where it's providing a service, we encourage them to go there, but despite that, they keep moving out of the treatment. I mean, you've asked experience, what is the most common malignant congenitality in the person? Malignancy presenting as a congenitality. Uh, I think it's the squamous cell entity. Okay. It's yeah. a systemic association. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, lymphoma, but, leukemia. Lymphomas have been there, but if you ask me the most common ones, yes, it's uh, squamous cell. But lymphomas, we do see quite a bit. About 13 to 14 cases in a year, for sure, we see lymphomas. So that's one entity we're uh, also keeping in mind about the genetic aspect as well. So that's mm -hmm. what we're working on now. Mm -hmm. uh, that apart, I think, uh, yes, I, I would say. And of course, we have other colleagues who, you know, often handle these lesions and uh, send us. <laughs> you know, we've had that issues as well. So it's not an entity which only uh, the ocular oncologists, not the oculoplastic surgeons hold, uh, you know, reign over. And uh, these are sometimes managed differently. I won't say mismanaged because I don't want to offend anybody but mismanaged and then sent over. So differently managed, probably. So we'll have to be aware of that entity as well. Mm -hmm. Ima, anything that you want to discuss or? No, Pharaoh's nothing, nothing specific. Okay. Uh, wonderful session, a lot of learning. For yeah, me. lots of learning. And Dr. Finger is here still. Uh, yeah. It's nice that we're having the South-North mix. And uh, I think bringing that experience 
also south, north, north as well as east yeah uh, yeah yeah and yeah, yeah. So, yeah it's I, i think it's a very nice uh, yeah. combination and contribution and now that uh, vikas is coming from the capital there to the capital here he north when he was in the ic yeah, then he yeah. to the south it's, it's it's really a lot of learning each one of us are learning from each other and it's good that th- these kind of discussion should be more often i think for us thank you firoz i think this was an excellent Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Anirban. Thank you, Dr. Sima. Thank you, Dr. Vikas. Thank you, Dr. Santosh. And a big thanks to Dr. Paul T. Finger, who's here with us, logged in from New York uh, on a Sunday morning. Thank you. Uh, I think all of us owe a big thank you to uh, Dr. Mm-hmm. Finger. I think it's very, very nice of him to be there throughout the session. I think he didn't blink. Mm-hmm. <laughs> If I'm not mistaken, <laughs> it was so nice of you, sir. It's a pleasure to see you all, and stay safe, stay well. Thank you. Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. I guess we come to the end of the session, and uh, good night. And we also come to the end of AIOC 2021. So thank.